Bill McKibben calls Gus Speth the greatest environmentalist of our time. Others have deemed him the ultimate Washington insider. Still others, a radical. James Gustav Speth joins me next on Connect. Hi, I'm Fran Stoddard. Gus Speth is a Yale Law School graduate, Rhodes Scholar, and U.S. Supreme Court Justice Clerk who went on to co-found the Natural Resources Defense Council and the World Resources Council. Speth served in the Carter and Clinton administrations and as head of the United Nations Development Program. When he was dean of the Yale School of Environmental Studies, he began to write books revealing that this southern gentleman and Washington insider is a radical thinker. He has been a professor at the Vermont Law School since 2010 and is now a fellow. So your resume is so much longer than that and quite remarkable. Um, but anyway, well, now... Well, all those groups have done better after I left. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. They've just continued to grow <laughs> after Thanks. being born so well. Thank you. Um, so you just wrote a, a lovely memoir called Angels by the River, where many of your thoughts are also published besides these great books but also it, it talks about you and some so we're going to talk a little bit about what what I learned from this book so you grew up in a small community in South Carolina where you were a wild child actually a terror I think your mom said yeah. and you certainly found a way to um, figure out how to harness your energy but how what are you most grateful about from that Southern upbringing? What, what kinds of qualities about being brought up in the South do you hold dear? Well, I think one thing, uh, uh, you mentioned that I was uh, a bit of a wild child and uh, in a d different environment, I'm sure I would have been swooshed off to some behavior therapy or drug regime or, or something, but they didn't know about those things. <laughs> Just as Th well that you didn't, thank perhaps. Th <laughs> thankfully, so mm -hmm. what I'm most thankful for was the uh, affection that, uh, you know, by, uh, uh, particularly from my mom and mm. from my girlfriend, uh, of the, uh, <laughs> who really uh, made me come to my senses and pull things together and, and quit being a, pro a problem child. Mm. Uh, and I'm, that, that was a, you know, I think a lot of people have that moment uh, growing up, you know, uh, there's, there's a big fork in the road and, mm -hmm. and things can go well for you mm -hmm. uh, and you can get it together and move on or you can begin a process of kind of falling apart and, and that happens too. Well, speaking of girlfriend, uh, you happen to marry that girlfriend mm -hmm. and, and you chose to live in Vermont, um, move up here. What, why did you choose Vermont for this chapter in your life? Well, I think it all, uh, my wife Cameron uh, and I uh, have a lovely daughter who went to Middlebury. Ah. And that started us moving uh, from New Haven and well, Washington at that time, D.C., uh, coming up to visit her. And we would always do something else. And we just fell in love with Vermont. So when I became the dean at Yale, we kept coming up to Vermont all the time. And finally, uh, we said, well, this deanship's going to be up in a decade. Why don't we move to Vermont? And uh, so we started looking for a place, and Stratford is a lovely town, but there are many other lovely towns uh, all over Vermont, and we are just so happy to be here. Uh, it, it is a, uh, a place that reminds us in, in many important and positive ways of the, the South that we hoped for mm. uh, a long time ago. Right. Well, Actually, and, and when you talk about the South, uh, one thing that, that struck me was that you, you, you said that the South has proven to be much more adept at exporting its vices than its virtues. And I think you have, could, could you read just a, a little bit of, of how, you, how you see that, how the, house, the, the yeah. South has kind of contributed to our deterioration? Well, we have to give, uh, you know, th th these, these big regional impacts coming from different regions of the country on, uh, as the country becomes more homogenized. And, and I, we give the South a tremendous credit for a great literature, mm -hmm. a lot of music, uh, a lot of athletes <laughs> and other things. Uh, but uh, on balance, uh, I, as, as you correctly say, I think the South has been more adept at exporting its, its vices than, than it, its virtues. And I, I did talk about that in the the memoir a little bit. So if you'll pardon me, Please. I'll read just a little teeny bit. Uh, 
the South has proven far more adept at exporting its vices than its virtues. A rancid politics combined with an ultra-conservative social and economic agenda, an antipathy towards the federal government, an uncritical embrace of American exceptionalism, the rise of the religious right, racial prejudice and the easy acceptance of de facto segregation all reflect the influence of the South on national life. The South is led in voter suppression, anti-union right to work laws, same-sex marriage bans, executions, and support for an abundant military spending and more. Growing up, we whites always said the South will rise again. And now it appears that the South has not only risen, but colonized great swaths of the American mind in the process. Mm. So it's, this is an indictment, in a way, of a lot of the things that, that happened that, that didn't have to happen this way. Mm. And, and we're seeing it um, certainly blossoming during this primary <laughs> season. Um, so uh, back to, uh, you've always been a lawyer for the public good. Um, and before we leave, I, I, I want to talk about Yale Law School and, and that, but you also work at uh, Vermont Law School. Uh, do law schools and young lawyers still have that focus and drive today for the public good? I mean, clearly, you're thinking about the public good. You're thinking about how the th South has affected that, what's happened to this country. Is that part of mo lawyering today? And in law schools, are people thinking differently? Well, I think it is very much part of the law school, and it's certainly very, very much part of the Vermont Law School, uh, which is a real blessing for, for the state, uh, that place. And, um, you know, for example, we um, have recognized, a lot of us, that the old environmental law, the cocoon that we spun in the early 70s for environmental law, uh, is now confining, and it's not solving the big environmental problems, and that we need to reinvent environmental law, that, the, the, that we need to come out of that uh, cocoon. And so we, at the school, we've created a, a center for uh, law in the new economy, mm. which is going to be an effort to reconceptualize environmental law so that it deals with deeper issues, uh, issues like consumerism mm. and other things. Uh, and, and so uh, I think there's, going, there's a lot of interest at the school in, in this new approach and, uh, and, and in the old approaches. So there's a strong public service spirit. Hmm. Not in all law students, but mind you, but, <laughs> but, uh, but many of them. But many, yes. Well, back to your first law school, Yale, uh, Yale and Yale Law School. How did that significantly change your worldview? When you came up north to Yale, you'd been living in South Carolina all your life. It was, and it was a very, this is the end of the 60s, um, a very turbulent time, not only in the south, but all over this country. Well, the first was a Yale undergraduate experience, and I had come fresh out of Orangeburg High in 1960, and, uh, and I had in, been brought up to believe a lot of things that didn't sit too well with a lot of other people. Mm. And eventually, uh, thanks to really being beaten around the head and shoulders a lot at Yale and having a lot of long arguments and debates and soul searching, uh, I came to realize that that was, uh, you know, this was a lot of garbage, uh, mm -hmm. and this was very uh, uh, was a system of evil that, that we had to fight against. And the interesting, the, the th racism, the racism in yeah, particular, yeah, mm -hmm. and, and so. it, it was, uh, I do, yes, what I mean was the system of segregation, yeah. total segregation, right up to the day that I left to mm -hmm. go to Yale, even though the Brown decision was six years earlier, uh, and. Uh, so uh, it, it became a, a cause for me mm. uh, and, uh, and, and, and many others. But an interesting thing happened. Uh, you know, when you, what you've been brought up to believe, your worldview, the scaffolding in your mm. mind, all of a sudden crumbles. Mm. And you realize that, uh, you know, this, this is nonsense. This is, it frees you up in, in an interesting way. It, mm. you, you become unmoored mm. from you know, your parental influences, your community influences, and you begin to look around and say, well, you know, what do I really believe? Mm. What's really important? And it's a very liberating uh, experience, and uh, I was blessed to have that opportunity. Uh, and then in law school, 
You know, we were powerfully motivated by the civil rights movement. It had come before us, so to speak, uh, and the, the litigation and the legislation on civil rights in 64 and 65, and uh, that was our model. And I remember saying to myself uh, one day, you know, well, the NAACP Legal Defense Fund is, is doing great things. Why don't we create uh, an NAACP Legal Defense Fund type institution for the environment? Why what an idea. What an idea. <laughs> and uh, it's lawyers thinking by analogy, you know, and that's what we were trained to do. And, um, and so we did. And in the end, that became the Natural Resources Defense Council. Right. And uh, they now have a budget in excess of $100 million a year and are leading influence pushing uh, the Obama administration to mm -hmm. finally do something ab about uh, the terrible problem, the most serious problem of, of climate change. Right. It was rather remarkable that you, you also see this as the most important period in environmental history, I think, that you talked about. When you founded, when you realized the next thing after racism, I mean, not, I mean, that both are still issues that are go ongoing, of course, yeah. but is the environment. How can we be lawyers for the environment? Uh, what was groundbreaking about that time, about what you wanted to do? How did you, okay, you saw that that was the next cause. Right. Well, there are two things about that period that, that I think many viewers will remember. Uh, first, there was a deep critique of American society. Uh, this emphasis on, on mindless growth, endless consumerism, uh, inequality, uh, poor jobs. There was a deep critique that environment was part of, environmental concern, among a lot of people. Um, and, and then there was the effort to, uh, to come to terms with pollution to do the Clean Air Act, to do the Clean Water Act, to do the Toxic Substances Control Act, and, uh, and so on. And these were two different paths forward in, in say, 1970. Uh, and what happened was that we took the path of getting these great laws implemented that, that Senator Muskie mm -hmm. and, uh, and others had, had, had written and, uh, and we had worked to get passed. And so we got these great laws passed and we said, well, let's put our legal talents into implementing them. And this other critique kind of got dropped by the wayside. Uh, mm. And uh, the, the critique of uh, limits to growth and other uh, efforts. The more economic. The, more, the deeply economic critique that said that the system is wrong. And, and what we're trying to do now is, is to recognize that the approaches that we took in the early 70s have pretty much run their course and we need to go back and, and question the system again. You know, when you have problems emerging across the whole front of national life, mm -hmm. environmental, social, political, economic, problems that just make you cry, and there's so many of them, and they're so deep, and, 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 and uh, so when you have that, you have to conclude, I think, and certainly I have, that these problems are, are, are manifestations of a broken system. Uh, it's not just somebody's accident or we didn't elect somebody. This, the system is not programmed to give good results and we basically need to start thinking about system change, yeah. deep change. And as you said, people were thinking about that in the 70s, but it didn't, it didn't stick. It did not stick and that's, uh, that's really the, the tragedy. And I, I tell this story in, in the memoir uh, in more detail. Uh, and uh, you know, it's not that what we did was wrong. It's just that it wasn't nearly enough. Mm. So would you say the environmental cause failed or it just it needed another piece? Well, it, it certainly... And this is your life's work. <laughs> yes. Well, uh, a lot of great things have been Indeed. done. A lot of great things have been accomplished. But when you look at the great global scale issues, we're in a lot more trouble today than we were in 1970. Mm. Mm -hmm. uh, when we started out with NRDC, for example, a lot more trouble. Uh, you know, we've won victory after victory, and we find ourselves on the cusp of a ruined planet, literally. Mm -hmm. uh, this failure to deal with the climate issue is, you know, the gravest uh, dereliction of civic responsibility in the history of the republic. Uh, it is, it, it's, it's, and, you know, meanwhile, we haven't done much to curtail the loss of biodiversity and, uh, and, and the impoverishment of ecosystems. Yeah. And, and, and so, 
It, it's, I think what it says is that even though our organizations have grown in strength and number, our environmental organizations and sophistication, mm. yeah. they uh, are no match. Uh, against the system that they're trying to work in. Well, speaking of the system, you worked for both the Carter and Clinton administrations um, on in, uh, the White House Council on Environmental Quality right. uh, for Carter. What did you learn about impact from nonprofit work versus impact you might have strived for in the government? You've been trying to solve this from a lot of different angles. Yeah, well, I think there's a, uh, there's a symbiosis there. Um, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the NGOs, uh, in our system, uh, the environmental organizations uh, are, are extremely important because they are the the force that uh, bells the cat and 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 is the counterbalance against uh, or tries to be the counterbalance against this tremendous industry mm -hmm. uh, lobbying and money and and everything. And now, uh, in an interesting uh, uh, sort of development, uh, we see Exxon. Uh, in a certain amount of trouble now. And the New York Attorney General investigating them, subpoenaing them for having deceived us about climate change. And that's very encouraging. But it's that kind of external pressure and balance that, 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 that journalists and, and, uh, and, and NGOs and mm -hmm. others can bring into our system. Uh, and, and we need that. But we also need something more. We also need to start thinking about how do we change the system. Right. Just before we get in, into that, what it was interesting to me that you also, as you then founded the World Resources Institute, because you saw it wasn't just the United States that needed to look at some of these issues, I, but it was a much larger problem. After being in these administrations, there's global environmentalism that we really have to. Well, we were ready at the end of the Carter administration to really tackle some of the global scale issues, including the climate issue, which we understood pretty darn well in 1980, uh, right. sad to say, uh, because very little has been done. The research was clear. The research then. was clear. It was clear even to Exxon uh, at that <laughs> point. And, um, but uh, we were, what we realized in the Carter administration is that we were kind of maybe, it, it, we were, if we, to the degree we were succeeding, we were making a fool's paradise here in the U.S. Mm -hmm. because we were uh, moving things forward on air and water pollution and other issues. Uh, but if you look at the global scale challenges, they weren't really being addressed in that era. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was, say, 1980. We, uh, we put out the Global 2000 report that called attention to the global scale issues. It was 12 years later, we finally got some international uh, treaties on climate and biodiversity. Right. Uh, and and, uh, and then you, you went on to the UN and, and became the, the head of development programs there. So this is, uh, again, kind of jumping back into government, uh, well, quasi, with, with the UN. Yep. What, what kind of impact were you hoping and able to make there? Well, the work was focused on, you know, this horrendous problem of, of world poverty and, and deprivation uh, uh, that's out there, and that was our mission in the UN. We did come to see that uh, that uh, you know that the environmental issues that I had been working on were were just tightly linked to the deprivation issues. But again, I came to see by the time I left the UN. Uh, that that the world that we had built was in this also a manifestation of a system that didn't give priority to people, mm. didn't give priority to places where people live, didn't give priority to our planetary mm. habitat uh, and local habitats, and that the and that this global system of neoliberalism, uh, which was so prominent in uh, in international affairs and and, and, and drove uh, uh, a, a lot of uh, behavior around the world, and including the World Bank initiatives mm, to mm -hmm. deregulate countries and to privatize things and to free market this and that and the other. And uh, so by the time I left the UN, I was beginning to put together the pieces that this was, these problems were systemic. Mm. We need a new political economy, and we, we can build it. And it's not threatening. And this could take some time, but we can do it. Well, speaking of that, when you became dean of 
Yale School of Forestry and Environmental Studies, somehow you found time to start writing <laughs> all these remarkable books. Um, yeah, I wonder what I should have been doing instead of. Uh, <laughs> uh, I don't know, <laughs> but I think it's time well spent. Um, Bridge at the Edge of the World and uh, America the Possible, where you talk about um, a call for a new economy, a new environmentalism, new politics, new governance. Um, and also, when you're talking people, place, um, you are also as much as you are global, you are talking about the smallest places needing to yeah. re-energize community. And I know my producer has found a, a lovely video of you talking about um, community. Well, it's certainly me talking, uh, <laughs> but uh, I was as, as blown away as, as uh, anybody might be uh, with what the artists did with my script. <laughs> And, uh, and how they, uh, they, they laid it out in a, uh, just a very engaging uh, yeah. cartoon type uh, video. Right. Um, and um, so it was built out of, uh, built out of uh, my book, America the Possible. Uh, and I was uh, the author of the script, and, and I tried to get out of being the, the voice, uh, but they <laughs> well, said, oh, you didn't. did it, <laughs> and I didn't. Let's take a quick look. In America the Possible, our neighborhoods are safe and resilient and fun places to live. Instead of feeling isolated and distrustful, people know their neighbors and they care for one another. Local businesses stay rooted and keep money in the community. And the virtues of simple living, community pride, and good citizenship are widespread. This is the America we want, but how do we get there? Of course we've got to so demand. Really How do we get there? That's the good well, question. <laughs> well, I think we're doing a lot of the right things in Vermont. Uh, we have uh, at the state level uh, a lot of the right programs uh, to, uh, to assist various uh, communities and issues. Uh, uh, Sustainable Jobs Fund, for example, uh, and uh, other Vermont initiatives, Farm to Plate and things. But the core of it is, is that we need to bring the future into the present at our local level. And, uh, and this is, uh, uh, the, you know, we, we celebrate New Economy Week uh, every year mm -hmm. uh, as, as a way of celebrating uh, all the great things that are actually happening around the country. Uh, new types of enterprises, public-private hybrids, uh, co-ops, uh, worker-owned enterprises, uh, public-owned enterprises, all kinds of, of business models that are coming forward. Uh, uh, credit, new credit unions, and maybe one day more state banks. We almost have one in, in, in Vermont. Uh, and uh, uh, a lot of people are trying in their own personal lives to, to transcend this uh, consumerism, this uh, shop till you drop, mm. and to get, beyond, uh, to get beyond that in their own lives, to, to downshift, to focus. And, and, and there's a movement to reclaim one's time uh, to uh, try to not, uh, you know, just work all the time uh, and, and to try to um, uh, have more time for family and friends and hobbies and volunteering and uh, recreation and all the things that really, you know, make life worthwhile. Uh, and uh, so uh, we need to, to push these uh, initiatives in our communities because one day there are going to be so many crises afflicting our country. People are going to look around and ask, you know, this is, this is not working. This system is not working. But that's working in, in, in that community. In, in, so in, in Stratford, we, we need the models. Right. And people, that's the most important thing. We can write all the books in the world, but when, you, when people look up and, and see that there are models uh, of, of things really working, of, of people taking care of each other in communities, uh, of, of local democracy, uh, of, of you know, uh, localized, rooted industries and, 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 man and other types of businesses, uh, local banking. Uh, you know, that, these are the models that will inspire people. Well, it seems like those are all American values. How did we, how did we lose that? How did we lose track of that? Well, I think um, we were led uh, down the wrong path. I mean, it's, it's not accidental that, uh, that we have this, um, you know, the super rich, because if you look at what's happened to taxation, it's favored them, and it's not favored the middle class. And, it, uh, and we've, uh, we had a war on poverty, uh, but we didn't follow through on it. Uh, 
mm. and now we have more poor people uh, than we ever have in, in history. And, and the rate of poverty is, is as high as it was back uh, before the war on poverty. And inequality is back up uh, you know, to where it was in the 20s. I, I sound like Bernie Sanders. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> Indeed, you know, and here's this Beltway insider that you know is now considered a radical. What, what do you? How do you consider yourself as we finish up? Oh, I would. I, I think um, in, in, in terms of two things. In terms of America's current political spectrum, uh, I guess my views would certainly be thought to be radical. Uh, but you know, when I was a little baby, Franklin Roosevelt uh, put out his Economic Bill of Rights. And he declared that this country, that everyone should have a right to a job. Everyone should have a right to health care. Everyone you know, should have a right to security in their homes and, uh, and a decent income and a good education. And he saw these as rights. And that wasn't that long ago. Uh, and so, so in that sense, it's not radical to me. <laughs> you're, you're a Roosevelt guy, a rightist. <laughs> Thank you so much, Gus Spess. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Gus Spess's latest book is called Angels by the River. Thank you for joining us. Vermont PBS would like to connect with you and keep the conversation going. You can always reach out with feedback and ideas at connect at vermontpbs.org. You can also check out other episodes and extra material at v vpt.org. See you next time. Or VermontPBS.org, and you'll hear Gus Beth on how Vermont is a lot like the South. <laughs>